let's circle back a little bit to kind of abolition and, and what you guys do with Project Nia. So last month, a group affiliated with the Black Lives Matter movement, which again is a giant movement, it's a very broad movement, a group called Campaign Zero actually released policy suggestions to deal with police violence. And you've written before, and we kind of talked about this even when we were talking about Project Nia before, about kind of the parameters of the mass criminalization debate. Um, I think I remember you wrote something along the lines of like the, the how, make, allowing people to, uh, ex, uh, to, to make the boundaries of acceptable demands. When you look at those policy suggestions, I guess kind of get, I want to get your thoughts on that and like, and the idea of, do you think that the broader movement is asking for too little? Do you think, I mean, I, kind of your thoughts on that because I, because it, it seems, I mean, I, obviously one of the demands is body cameras, which you and I have talked about before as like a kind of something to be a little wary of because most likely it'll be turned. It's not pointing at the cop. It's pointing at the, at the normal person here. But so I guess let's talk about the boundaries of acceptable demands when it comes to the, the, the policy suggestions. Yeah. Well, so I want to say that I am really a hundred percent in support of anybody making any sort of demand right. about anything. I you know, I think I think it's fine to make demands. I think it's fine to, uh, you know, off issue policy statements. I think everybody, you know, has a right to do that and that, it, you know, it's well and good that people should do that. Um, my, my concern has been raised at the, it's the risk, it's the reaction to those, um, policy proposals that are being offered that is concerning to me for two reasons. And I, and this, I don't think this is coming from the people who are making the, the offering the policy, right? I think the media has anointed certain people as leaders of what you mentioned is a broad based, yeah. uh, decentralized. Um, I don't know if I would even call it a movement yet, but I'll use that term, you know, for, for finding a, for lack of a better one for now, but, that is part, like, there are many people and many individuals, many groups and organizations, many that, that kind of organize right now under this broad banner of Black Lives Matter, right? Which you could really just think about as the Black Liberation Movement. You know, you could literally take Black Lives Matter and then change it to the Black Liberation Movement to let people understand, like, kind of what that looks like, right? So pe lots of people who are organizing under the Black Liberation Movement. Um, and, and a few people, a very small group of people, you know, going out and doing something and putting it out as a policy statement, then get lifted up because their policy statements are super reformist and comfortable then for the elites, and they then get lifted up as, like, these policy uh, statements and these policy suggestions are really sensible. They're, like, really, uh, you know, well-researched. They're, like, you know, the best policy uh, pieces ever because they already exist in some places. So, therefore, people will be less likely to push back against them, and they'll have a better chance of, quote, passing, right? Like, everything is being constra constructed and conceived of under the banner of what can pass in this current messed up as health system, mm -hmm. and what is, like, what the elites think is serious, right. right? And so what they've done is actually then boxed out a whole crew of other people, including people at Project Mia, myself and others, who suggest that the actual roots of this problem merit transformation and not reform. And though we get painted within this larger conversation as the unreasonable crew, and the folks who put out the very reformist document are pa as praised as revolutionary, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it, it just turns on its head so much of what is needed to actually transform the system. We get stuck again in pitting, like, the good, sound, serious organizer versus the 
ideological, demagogic, rabid, <laughs> you know, abolitionists who are unrealistic, right? And like, yeah. but that's being defined for a reason too. Yeah. You know, there's not. It's not like you know that people are comfortable with the other group, the reformers, and they're super uncomfortable with everybody else who's saying revolution and transformation. Um, and so we get painted as wild-eyed and unrealistic. And that that's a way of, that's a way of remaining, uh, continuing to be able to assert control over the narrative and to also define and predefine what's acceptable terms for discussion within this moment. So everything else gets, gets seen as an outlier. And you don't have to really take it seriously. You don't have to discuss it. When people say abolish pris- abolish prisons and police, that's like, well, that's not going to happen. Right. So let's really, you know, let's focus on body cameras and let's focus on, you know, uh, a new, I don't know, civilian review board. And let's focus on, but I always say, well, we have body cameras. Yeah. And we're, the police are still killing people. Yeah. Um, we've got training. <laughs> They're training people every single... People are still kill, getting killed. And I want to also say that the other thing that I worry about and I've been really pushing back against for a while now is the conversation about police and policing mm-hmm. cannot be defined maybe by who they're killing and how how often they kill. Yeah. The conversation has to be about the fact that police and policing writ large is super violent. That stop and frisk is the most um, kind of uh, prevalent use of policing that people encounter, particularly black youth in the communities that are being over policed. That's the tactic that they come into, you know, action that they have to respond to, and that they are constantly being abused with on a regular basis. Most of those young people aren't being killed by the police, but. All, most of them are absolutely being targeted and harassed and touched inappropriately and, you know, and, and their movements surveilled and, like, on a daily basis. And if we can't, you know, if we focus only or mainly on the killing as the thing that we're trying to stop, which is important because people are dying, we do have to focus on that. But the vast majority of what police and policing is, is the you know, kind of containment of a group and a population through multiple uses of invasive surveillance and, of you know, targeting practices. That's the daily grind. I wrote about this in a piece called Summer Heat um, for the New Inquiry a couple of months ago. Like, that's the, the part of police and policing that most young people in particular, young black people, are so you know, vehemently against and are organizing their hearts out, not just on the killing front. Black Lives Matter is actually asking you to look broadly at how various practices of policing are meant to contain and harm and target, right? Well, not also just the fact the that, that, that that system does actually feed into the killing part of that. You know, if, it, if, if that, that tension and that oppression actually allows the killing to be a lot easier. If, if it wasn't that yeah. constant oppressive state, mm-hmm. the, 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 that, that, that living in that realm consistently makes the killing easier to actually oh. happen all, all the time, like it does. That's right. That's right. And also that, you know, for example, one of the things that you have to talk about if you're talking about addressing the kind of, um, you know, the oppressive policing that people are subjected to regularly is you have to change the financial uh, incentives. So one of the proposals in this recent, I guess, Campaign Zero list of um, demands and, and ideas and policy stuff that a few um, people who've been organizing under Black Lives Matter um, put out recently in this last week, one of the things was like stop for profit policing. I think that's good and that's true. It's like, you know, using these um, fines, you know, what they basically were doing in Ferguson, which was mass, uh, you know, usury, mass um, ransom, I right. call it, uh, that was being extracted from people to be able to pay basically for the municipal government to operate through these fines and these excessive warrants and all the stuff that they were doing. And that's good, you know, we should really do that. But really, we have to abolish monetary bail as yeah. a way, 
to also really get at the police not being allowed to like pick people up and then having those people languish in the in the in jails while the court system runs at like low speed, yeah. right? And spending spending weeks and days and months and sometimes years behind bars because they can't afford bail, cash bond. You know, I think we have to talk about that like that's a reform that's actually going to shorten the reach of the prison industrial complex. That's a reform that's gonna actually lead to decarceration. Right? Yeah. So that's a reform I can support. I can support non-reformist reforms, <laughs> reforms that are intended to actually shorten the reach of the prison industrial complex. If your reform is intended to do that, then I, that's a reform you can support. And I did, I wrote a piece a, a year ago, maybe by now, that was uh, posted um, prison culture blog that was like police reforms you should support. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like, right. you can support. And it's like, all of them are non-reformist reforms or transformational demands that will actually shorten the reach of the thing you are trying to dismantle, rather than putting new things in place that will make it harder for you to abolish the thing you're trying to dismantle. That's what reformist reforms do. They actually put more things in your pathway that make it harder for you to actually dismantle the system or the institution you're trying to dismantle and transform. And some of these, uh, you know, I feel like some of these reforms that are being offered are completely reformist reforms. So they're doing the opposite of what they hope. You know, I think that body cameras are one of those. I think body cameras are reformist reforms, and we, we need non-reformist reforms in order to be able to transform this current situation.